Matthew Segge here from Verity Baptist Church, Manila, providing you another video on the topic of Calvinism and most specifically total depravity. And one argument that Calvinists like to use is in John chapter 6, verse 44, where the Bible reads, No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me, draw him, and I will raise him up to the last day. So the Bible says that you cannot come unless the Father draws you. And so they'll look at this verse and say, well, see, some people are drawn and some people are not drawn. And so if you're not drawn, you're going to go to hell. And if you are drawn, you're going to go to heaven. No matter what, if you're drawn, you're going to get saved and believe on Jesus, they say. But if you're not drawn, you're going to go to hell. Well, let's compare spiritual things with spiritual and see what it says in John chapter 12. Because it's very clear in John 6 that unless the Father draws you, you cannot come. You're not going to be able to go to heaven unless the Father draws you. Well, in John chapter 12, verse 32 and 33, this is what it says. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. So Jesus says that if I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all men unto me. And so the Bible is very clear that Jesus is going to draw all men. Now here's where Calvinists don't understand this, and most Christians don't understand this. And that's that, you know, a God draws everybody, but there are certain people where he stops drawing them at a certain point. So when it says you can't come unless the Father draws you, there are people here on earth that become walking dead men because they've rejected God so long that they become a child of the devil, which we've talked about in earlier videos. But he did die for everyone and he drew everyone. It's just that some people can reach a point on earth where they've lost their chance to be saved. But it's very clear he's going to draw all men onto him. Jesus died for everybody's sins. He wants everybody to be saved, and it's our choice if we're going to believe on Jesus Christ. And if we believe on Jesus Christ, then we become a child of God and we're on our way to heaven. So if you compare spiritual things with spiritual and you look up that word draw, well, it's very clear in John 12 that if he be lifted up from the earth, which he was, he will draw all men onto him. Now, what Calvinists will argue is, well, I mean, if he draws all men onto them, then why don't they just all go to heaven? Look, because he gives us free will whether or not we're going to accept him or not. It doesn't say that you're guaranteed you're going to heaven if he draws you or you're forced to go to heaven. No, we have our free will to accept. Yes, he draws everyone, and we have our choice if we believe or not. Thank you, and God bless. Okay, so uh, there you have just very, very standard uh, surface level. Um, you know, there you go. Uh, surface level argumentation, very, very common. That's what makes it useful to refute it. Uh, we always have new new folks uh, listening and tuning in and stuff like that, so it, it's good to go over uh, this uh, this type of stuff. And so, what did we uh, what did we see there? Well, uh, you have your your standard argumentation, your standard uh, uh, lack of any meaningful exegesis. You went to John six forty four. You did not notice there was no reference to how verse forty four functions in the entirety of John six. When you begin at John 6.35, you can start back at John 6.1 if you want to, but if you, if you begin at John 6.35, you begin after the miracle of the walking on the water, uh, and you're now in the synagogue of Capernaum, you start following that context along, and John 6.44 already comes after the clear statements of God's absolute sovereignty in this matter, of the fact that he has a people he gives unto the Son. There's nothing in here about a free will of man. There's everything about the free will of God. Man is unable, God is able. It's the exact opposite of the external stuff that he brought in, never gave a biblical citation, never gave anything from the text, just simply assumes, and he can assume that the vast majority of the people he's going to be talking to are going to accept the idea of the free will of man. They're not going to give you any Bible references to it. Well, you know, there's free will offerings. Well, that doesn't exactly equate to the same thing as man having a free will. There's all sorts of statements in Scripture about man's will being enslaved and about man not being able to do certain things and all the rest of this stuff. It's very, very plain, very, very clear. But keeping that stuff out, if you follow John 6, God the Father gives a certain people to the Son. The Son raises them all up. Uh, they are looking to him only because of what God the Father has first done in giving them to the Son. Um, Jesus comes down out of heaven not to do his own will, but the will of the Father who sent him. What's that will? That he lose none that are given to him, but raise them all up on the last day. Jesus is able to be the perfect Savior. There's nothing in there about man's faith actuating it. No, it's all of God.
And so you get to verse 44, the people are complaining. They say, you know, you're making yourself the center of all this stuff. Who do you think, who do you say that you are? And what does Jesus say? No one can come, stop grumbling. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Now, if anyone ever, when you are dealing with a biblical passage, if anyone ever uh, says, well, you know, and this is, people get away with this. I've seen it happen in our own circles. I've seen it happen in churches. I've been in over and over again. Didn't it strike anybody as strange that instead of giving a meaningful contextual interpretation from John 6, the immediate thing that this young man does is he jumps out of John 6, six chapters later, John chapter 12. And he excuses this, he excuses this complete abandonment of context, complete abandonment of exegesis. And amongst this group, exegesis is a bad word. Um, they don't like the term exegesis because they don't do exegesis. You can't meaningfully present the Bible as the Word of God without doing exegesis, and that's one of the issues with the new, new independent fundamentalist Baptist movement. But you didn't it stri strike anyone as strange that you would think that Jesus' words would have a meaning to the people he was talking to at that time. But if the only way to interpret it is to bring in something from six chapters later and then call that comparing spiritual with spiritual. That sounds wonderful. What does it mean? Is comparing spiritual with spiritual a way of getting around doing the hard work of exegesis? Getting around actually um, allowing the Word of God to speak for itself? Because, you see, the NIFB presents so many doctrines and theologies that are unknown to the Apostles. That's why they, they have to mock exegesis, because they have to proof text stuff without reference to context, and they look down upon people who are careful to stop speaking when God's Word stops speaking. In other words, so much of what they think is just absolutely, I mean, this guy also has a whole series attacking repentance. I mean, how you can read the New Testament and not see the absolute centrality of repentance, that it's, it's the mark of the, of the Christian life, it is the beginning, it is ab it's the work of the Spirit of God. See, again, they think it's all works because they, they reject God's sovereignty in, in, in salvation. They think we're working this all up within ourselves. Faith is something we do, and so repentance must be something to do, and so it's only faith. They can't see and cannot develop a balanced biblical understanding of the relationship of faith and repentance and works because they don't have God as the one who's the source of all these things. They're synergists, so they, they can't come up with it. And so they end up with this horrifically stilted and odd and, and strange and at times downright heretical uh, perspective but they don't get that stuff from exegesis. This is their traditions, and then they use Scripture. You can't do exegesis if you're going to be doing this kind of stuff. So you jump to something later on, call it comparing spiritual with spiritual, which is just simply abandoning context. And then don't even bother to note that, in, that you are reading your own meaning into John chapter 12. Because when Jesus says, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men into myself, you're saying every single person in the world is drawn unto Jesus by the crucifixion, even though the Bible says the cross is foolishness to men. It's a stumbling block. Stone of stumbling. A scandal on. You don't even hear yourself? It's, it's, that's one of the problems, the, these guys, one of, the, one of the, the problems with NIFB and a lot of IFB people is you've got an echo chamber, and all you hear is the same stuff being repeated over and over again, and there's never any challenging. There's never any... That's what's good about, you know, I'm very thankful that I have friends who do not agree with me on every single point that there is. They challenge me to think about things. I, I see things from another perspective. When I, when I went to Fuller, I saw things from another perspective. Now, Fuller back then was not what Fuller is to today. I could not ever recommend anybody going there. But, but back then... Uh, most of my teachers, I already knew from, from Grand Canyon, but there were, there were others. And it was like, I had never thought about that before. And unlike uh, a lot of the people in the uh, uh, emergent church and stuff like that, I didn't just throw everything out. You analyze what it is you've been taught and realize, oh, uh, okay, I, here's the core. These, this, these are the next things, so on and so forth. 
and you grow in your understanding of what's definitional, what's not definitional, what's called the adiaphora, the things that do not make a difference. Um, and when you encounter anybody who has no adiaphora, anybody who has no adiaphora, run for the hills. This is one of the marks of fundamentalism, is that there's no adiaphora. Everything's definitional. You have to believe like me all the way down to every little thing. And that makes the Trinity and uh, whether you go swimming in the same pool of females, they're all on the same level. And that's disastrous. That's disastrous. Just look around and see how disastrous it is. Uh, we, we've seen the results of this for a very, very, very long time. Anyway, um, so he jumps off to John 12, doesn't realize that it means all kinds of men because of the context where the Greeks are seeking after Jesus. So that's, that's what the context John 12 is. Reads his errant interpretation of that back into John 6, interrupting the flow of the argument and calls that good. Without ever realizing that in the process, what Jesus said, no man is able to come to me unless the Father sent me, draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. By introducing the concept of synergism, man's free will, man's choice, and cramming it in there before that last phrase, you are left with an incoherent statement. Jesus says, that if you're drawn by the Father, Jesus will raise you up in the last day. To be raised up in the last day is to be raised to eternal life. That's the context from John 6, 37 and following. So, in John 6, 44, it's all of God. Salvation is perfect. It's perfect harmony of the Father and the Son, uh, perfectly to the glory of the triune God. It's, it's beautiful. But once you break that, now you've got, well, a broken mass. And if all that are drawn by the Father to the Son, are raised up by the Son, you've got universalism. Well, no, 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 we've got our free will. Where is that in John 6, again? And see, they can't derive one of the key elements to be able to recognize meaningful exegesis. Is it derived from the text itself? Because we, we can go back to verse 35, follow it through, go on to 45, go on down. It's a perfect, seamless, beautiful whole. There is no such thing as a perfect, seamless, beautiful whole anywhere in NIF, NIFB interpretation. It's all proof texting. It's never derived just from the text itself. And so that's what you just saw. Um, that, that's not exegesis. That's not allowing the text to speak for itself. And yet that's what people find to be very, very... If, if you want to remain comfortable where you are, that's the way to do it. That's the way to do it. Just, just explain it away, and, and all will be well, and, and, and you go from there.